Bonjour. J'espère que tout le monde a bien déjeuné. Tout est leur place. On va, on va commencer euh, la séance de l'après-midi avec le professeur Arthur Fine de l'Université de Washington. Arthur Fine de l'Université de Washington va parler de structural realism then and now. Arthur? Uh, I'm wired. <laughs> um, bonjour, uh, Monsieur Dame. Um, I'm pleased, indeed, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I want to thank the organizing committee for that opportunity and for the splendid conference they've put together. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff um, who've made um, uh, people like myself, um, who are not used to this environment, feel very comfortable and have been helpful in every way. Um, we all know, of course, that Poincaré was a great mathematician, uh, made uh, many seminal contributions to mathematics, was the originator of numbers of programs, as we've, as we've heard in the last couple of days, um, and uh, a great uh, mathematical physicist, uh, or theoretical physicist more generally. Um, but there was a third arrow to Poincaré's work, um, and that is his work as a philosopher. And um, that's the aspect that I want to talk about today. Now, Poincaré's philosophy comes out of his scientific work. He's a philosopher in a very particular sense, not a systematic thinker, not someone like Kant. Um, but he's, or Aristotle, um, but someone whose philosophical thought comes out of reflections on his own scientific work. And in that sense, um, he's a very contemporary philosopher, since much of contemporary philosophy comes out of reflection of practice of one kind or another. Um, and he's contemporary in another sense, uh, and that is that uh, many people working in philosophy today are also working on Poincaré. I have, for example, um, supervised two dissertations, one on Poincaré's philosophy of mathematics um, and one on Poincaré's uh, work on um, geometry versus empirical science. And uh, there are others I know of in the works right now. Now, when philosophers talk about Poincaré, um, they generally tend to talk either um, about his philosophy of mathematics, um, which is, of course, very appropriate and also very interesting, um, concentrating perhaps on his uh, intuitionism um, or on his um, important but very difficult to understand notion of predicativity um, in mathematics. Um, or else, if they're interested in uh, Poincaré as philosopher of empirical science, um, then um, they're very, uh, very much interested in his uh, notion of uh, conventionalism and in trying to draw a distinction between his geometric conventionalism and his conventionalism with respect to the sciences proper, um, or trying to sort out um, the tangle that he himself created in distinguishing um, the notion of hypotheses in various and overlapping ways. And I think in uh, yesterday's talk by Jeremy Gray, um, both of these, or all of these topics um, were touched on. And if I understand it, um, tomorrow's talk by Gerard Heitzman uh, will probably concentrate more on the hypothesis uh, aspect. Um, today, I'm going to do something completely different. So uh, I could begin by telling you what I'm not going to do, which is uh, none of the above. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is um, to uh, give a talk that is very similar to a number of the technical talks that we've already heard in this conference, which is to begin with some uh, reflections of Poincaré, some pregnant, interesting suggestions addressed to a particular problem, and then to show what happens um, and has happened in the course of time up to the very present um, with those, uh, those suggestions. So the the topic that I'm going to be concerned with is structural realism. And um, I'll begin with a brief summary of, uh, of how the talk will go. Um, begin with this wonderful quotation, Poincaré feared that the ephemeral nature of scientific theories could be seen as amounting to 
what he called the bankruptcy of science. Now, there's an interesting story to be told about that phrase, which I originally thought was one of Poincaré's many beautiful expressions, but turns out to be um, an expression common um, in the latter 19th century and reflecting actually a quite anti-science, um, religiously motivated attack on science. Um, that's not Poincaré's concern, um, as I will explain. Um, so what I want to do is then to tra trace out a little bit of the history of the kind of response that Poincaré begins, um, beginning with Poincaré and then contrasting him with Duhem, with Dewey, with Russell, um, and with Weil. And I will do that uh, rather briefly. Um, and then I will try to um, give some interpretation of a certain confounding of conceptions that I think is involved um, both in Poincaré and in part, and in, part in some of the transition. Um, then I want to look very briefly, sketch out briefly, a modern view of uh, structural realism. Um, and then I want to look much more seriously and critically at the uh, contemporary structural realism debate. Um, and I will end with some pictures um, which suggest that um, there's some serious criticism to be made of this whole program. So um, let's uh, begin with Poincaré. Um, and um, this wonderful quote that comes out of the Foundations of Science in 1905. At first blush, it seems to us that theories last only a day, that ruins upon ruins accumulate. Today, theories are born. Tomorrow, they are fashion. The day after tomorrow, they are classic. The fourth day, they are superannuated. And the fifth day, they are forgotten. Um, now, uh, <laughs> uh, OK, so in the contemporary literature, this idea that the sciences come and the sciences go um, is sometimes referred to as the disastrous, um, sometimes as the pessimistic meta-induction. Meta because it's an induction over the history of science. It's very important that you have to write all the 1840. So 1842. Ah, I've got it twisted. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, anyway, so, uh, uh, they, so that these theories come and go, and that it's a meta-induction because it's over the history of science, and it's a disastrous or pessimistic meta-induction because if you carried it out as a kind of straight-line induction, then of course you would conclude that today's theories, however, whatever the evidence, however well confirmed they are, um, are also um, are going to come and go and with them the various objects that we think of as the objects of scientific interest and the properties that we think of them as having. Um, so Poincaré's um, solution to this problem of the passing phase of, uh, of science um, is to focus on relations. And so what he tells us is that if, uh, if a theory taught us and here I want to emphasize a true relation, then this relation is definitely acquired. And it will be found again under a new guise in other theories, which will successively come to reign in the place of the old. So the interesting suggestion is that if we want to deal with the problem of theories that come and go with a pessimistic induction, um, then what we want to do is we want to focus on relations. Okay, because relations are going to be part of the permanent furniture, provided, he says, that they're true relations. Now, the thing to pay attention to here is, to, is the question of relations among or between what? Are we talking about relations in the data? Are we talking about relations in the data models? That is, the data as process, the phenomena? Um, are we talking about relations about whatever it is in reality that underlines the phenomena? Okay? Um, these remarks here are certainly ambiguous about that. I want to compare um, Poincaré's remarks here um, with uh, those of Pierre Duhem um, on a related topic. Now, like Poincaré, uh, Duhem is often considered 
um, I use Jeremy Gray's word from yesterday, a kind of skeptic, or to have a skeptical attitude, um, very often classified as an instrumentalist. Um, and if you read uh, remarks like this, then of course it looks that way. I mean, um, the, the scientific hypotheses are only devised in order to save the phenomena, they don't reflect uh, what's really going on in the world. On the other hand, uh, that's from um, his book, 1908, um, he also tells us that physical theory confers on us knowledge of an external world which is irreducible to merely empirical knowledge. And then he goes on to say in a very famous passage, it is not merely an artificial system suitable today and useless tomorrow, making reference to the pessimistic induction here, um, but an increasingly natural classification, which is to say a system of relations. So it seems that Duhem and Poincaré here are trying to focus on the same problem, the same solution to the same problem, namely look at relations. Um, I say this is a very famous passage of Duhem's. It's really an infamous passage because everyone who interprets Duhem interprets this passage differently. Um, there's a very nice article, uh, and if you can read it at the end there, um, by Karen America King as Darling um, in Philosophy of Science, um, who draws out these contrasting instrumentalist, uh, realist aspects of Duhem. Uh, now, what I actually want to do here is to digress very briefly. Um, I can't help it, um, coming from the continent that I come from, um, and mention a little bit about John Dewey, who also struggled with this problem of the so-called pessimistic induction. Um, and here's what Dewey says, if we can get it. He talks about, in a longer passage, um, how scientists are wrestling with a problem. Um, and he describes what goes on. Um, there is evolution of new techniques of control and inquiry. There is search for new facts. There is an institution of new types of experimentation. Uh, there is gain in the methodic, a methodical um, control of experience. And all of this is progress. So in the course of scientific investigation, all of these things are going on. And then Dewey goes on to comment, it is only the worn out cynic, the devitalized sens sensualist, the fanatical dogmatist, who interprets the continuous change of science as proving that since each successive statement is wrong, the whole record is simply error and folly, um, and that the present truth is only the error not yet found out. Now, I want to contrast um, Poincaré and Duhem's approach to this issue um, with Dewey's, just really briefly. What Poincaré and Duhem both suggest in slightly different ways is a solution to a problem. Right? Problem is, what do we do about the fact that theories come and go? Well, we focus on relations which are more stable. Okay? Um, what Dewey does with the problem is to make a characteristic, pragmatic move. What Dewey says is, there isn't really a problem. If you pay attention to what scientists actually do, you'll see that in the course of every investigation, some progress is made. Right? Not progress with respect to relations, not progress with respect to this and that, but progress all over the place. So it's a very different way of thinking about it. Um, but to return to Poincaré, if we can here, um, this is what he has to tell us about Maxwell's equations. Um, they express relations. Um, um, and the equations remain true. It's because the relations preserve their reality. <coughs> Reality where? Reality about real things or reality about the phenomena or the data? <clears throat> they teach us now, as they did then, that there is such and such a relation between this thing and that, only the something which we then called motion, uh, we now call electric current, but these are merely names for the images we substituted for the real objects, which nature will ever forever hide from our eyes. So the problem is, as he poses it here, we can't know what the real things are between which relations hold. Okay? Um, and that's why we can't focus on the things 
but we can focus on the relations that hold between the things. Um, so again, um, the true relations between these real objects are the only reality we can attain. And the sole condition is that the same relation shall exist between these objects as between the images we are forced to put in their place. So here is a picture of the phenomenal world. Those are the, that's the world of images and the language that we use, and the real world. And looking at relations in the phenomenal world, we project, as it were, isomorphically um, to what must be the case in the real world, although we can't really know anything about it. OK, not anything directly. Um, so uh, Poincaré is pretty serious about this. Um, so um, this is what he has to say about the principle of conservation of energy. Uh, if we wish to enunciate the principle in all its generality and apply it to the universe, we see it vanish, so to speak. And nothing is left but this. This is the principle of conservation of energy. Something is constant. Okay. That's what we can actually learn, um, that something is constant. Um, this may be a reductio um, of the view. Um, if not, it seems to me it's very close to a reductio of the view. But um, let's persist for a bit. Um, now, that's when Poincaré is talking about um, this coming and going of scientific theories. Um, but he carries on another dialogue which is um, not about that, but which is about the topic of objectivity. And what he says about objectivity is uh, very important. Um, he says that what is objective is what must be common to many minds. Okay, so now we're not talking about real or what's real or what's true, but what's common to many minds. Um, and consequently transmissible from one to the other. He thinks quality is not so transmissible but uh, relations are transmissible. From this point of view, what is objective are only pure relations. So the focus on relations here, we get a very different angle. We're not trying to find out what's real. We're trying to find out what's objective in the sense of can be transmitted from one person to another or intersubjectively transmissible. So I'm going to flip to uh, Bertrand Russell a little bit later, who we'll see expresses um, very much the same ideas. Uh, the most that can be known, and that only in the most hopeful view, is that there are certain relations in the physical world, etc. Notice again the epistemological twist, the most that can be known. Right? This is very much like what Poincaré had to say. OK, um, I have a lot of quotations here. I don't think I will read them through. Uh, take, for example, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, take, for example, what's common between a gramophone record. Um, I think some of you in the audience don't know perhaps what a gramophone record is. Um, think of a disc, <laughs> OK? Um, and the music it plays. The two share certain structural properties, uh, which can be expressed in abstract terms, et cetera. In virtue of their structural similarity, one can cause the other. I think this is one of the most puzzling remarks in the whole Russellian corpus. We have two structural relations, not two events, not two things that happen, but two structural relations. And one structure can cause the other structure. Um, I've never been able to understand what Russell means. Um, but this quote from Russell is actually what brought me um, many, many years ago now to do philosophy. Uh, ordinary language is totally unsuitable for expressing what physics really asserts. Since the words of everyday life are not sufficiently abstract, only mathematics and mathematical logic can say as little as the physicist means. So I think that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful attitude. Um, it's an attitude that's basically shared by Hermann Weyl. Um, again, science can only determine its domain of investigations up to an isomorphic mapping. Uh, the particulars uh, are re uh, remains quite indifferent to the essence of the objects. The idea of isomorphism demarcates um, the boundary of cognition. Here the word is erkentness of what we can know. Um, 
But even if we do not know, that is, can and are not acquainted with the things in themselves, that is, with real reality, uh, we have just as much cognition, knowledge about them as we do about the phenomena through the disclosure of these isomorphic relations. So here, too, is this idea that we can establish in the data um, sets of relations which could be very well confirmed empirically, and then we simply project those relations to that which we can't know anything else about, right, um, to the real stuff. So it's the same idea we see repeated once in Poincaré, another time in Russell, another time in Weil, but I remind you, um, not an idea um, that Dewey picks up in his response to the same problem. Well, here I want to suggest that there are two problems of knowledge. Um, I've been suggesting it all along. Uh, one problem of knowledge is to find out what's real, or if you like, what's true. Um, if you take truth as correspondence to reality, then these are basically the same question. Um, and the picture here is to go back to Kant, um, and Kant who says that we have to assume the existence of the noumena, the noumena are the things in themselves, the objects concerning which we cannot know by perception or ordinary means anything, but we have to assume that there are such objects or else the world is not intelligible for us, okay? Um, and in the 19th century, a great many um, scientists reflecting on what they were doing in doing their scientific work thought that they were overcoming the Kantian problem of the noumena. Um, insofar as they could have well-established scientific knowledge, then they could project that knowledge, not just to the empirical or the phenomenal realm, but they could project it from the phenomenal realm down to the realm of the noumena, right? And that's how you find out how things really and truly are, all right? That's the, that's the picture here. Um, but there's another um, problem of knowledge, and it's a problem about um, What's objective? When do we consider something to be a part, part and parcel of objective knowledge? And um, one conception of the scientific enterprise is that we're after reality or truth or something along those lines. But a quite different conception is that what we're after is objective knowledge. Okay, And these, I think, are two very different issues. So um, I think what we find in Poincaré and Weil and also very clearly in Arthur Eddington whom I didn't um, have time to find quotes from, um, is this equation, that what counts as objective or objective knowledge is something that's intersubjectively communicable. Okay, we saw that very clearly um, in one of the quotes that I had earlier from Poincaré. Uh, what's um, intersubjectively communicable is what's invariant, sorry, under changes in points of view, what's non-perspectival. Um, what's non-perspectival are structures, relational structures, um, that are preserved by a set of quote-unquote admissible transformations. This is an idea pursued by uh, Robert Nozick in, in, uh, in his last book, which was called Invariance. Um, and it's the idea that I've tried to highlight a little bit here. I don't know how well we can see it uh, with, uh, get my with Arthur Eddington, who described this as the point of view of no one in particular, a phrase that I think is very, very appropriate. But this whole idea of objectivity as intersubjective communicability, which leads to this, this conception of what's objective is what's invariant, um, has to do with um, admissible or preferred transformations, and that all has to do with us. And so this pulls away from the idea of getting at the noumena, getting at the things in itself, the things that are unknowable, okay, um, to something that's socially and humanly centered. And so it pulls away from um, the idea of objective as what's really real um, to the idea of something that's suitable for what I call here a constructivist or a conventionalist picture. And of course, um, that's a picture um, that's very often associated with Poincaré. So, um, so that's the background, and that's the suggestion. And now I want to look very quickly um, at the modern revival, beginning with uh, Ernan McMullen um, in a very widely read piece. 
um, says that the basic claim of scientific realism um, is that the long-term success of science gives us reasons to believe in something like the entities and the structures postulated by the theory. So again, it's this picture of projecting down from empirical um, structures to structures in the real world. Um, but here I want, to, want you to note that when McMullen first announces this idea, he talks about entities and structure. Um, scientists construct theories which explain the observed features of the physical world by postulating models of the hidden structures of the entities being studied. So that's the picture. We're trying to model in our science the hidden structures, right? the noumenal structures. Um, later, John Worrell um, revives a kind of uh, position that he calls structural realism. The rule seems to be that whenever a theory replaces a predecessor, which has enjoyed genuine predictive success, the mathematical equations of the old reemerge as limiting cases of the mathematical equations of the new. This is precisely a version of Poincaré's idea that structure is preserved. Um, so the structural realist then simply asserts that in view of the theory's empirical success, the structure of the universe is probably something like what the theory says, um, repeating um, the, the words of McMullen pretty, pretty closely here. Notice um, there's an inference involved here. I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, it's the inference from the success of science to the reality of the scientific claims. Okay, it's a very particular kind of inference and a very odd one. Um, finally, the most latest um, version of structural realism um, is so-called ontic structural realism. Um, book that came out in 2007 called Everything Must Go by James Ladyman and uh, Don Ross um, is the Bible for this particular kind of structural realism. I'll give you just a quick flavor of it. Um, in the title, Everything Must Go, um, the emphasis really needs to be on things, right? It's everything that must go because the basic axiom here is that there are no things, okay? Um, structure is all there is. So it's like turtles all the way down, but in this case it's structure all the way down. There are no things. Um, what do we do with objects? Well, objects are sort of pragmatic devices um, that um, agents use, that agents means you and me, um, to orient ourselves in the world. Okay, so they're sort of provisional tools. Um, uh, Poincaré sometimes uses the phrase useful fictions, um, so one might, uh, one might think of them that way. Um, what's very striking to me about this is that objects, I mean we have to provide some account of objects, so the chromatic device is used by agents, used by agents, that's you and me, who are also objects, who are presumably also merely pragmatic devices used by agents, but what agents are using us and for what purposes? Um, I think we see here a real problem for ontic structural realism, uh, namely, can you have just relations all the way down? Um, there's a long history here um, that includes uh, people like Carnap and Carnap's so-called outbow problem, and um, we could talk about it in the question period, but I want to move on. Okay, so I want to give you a really quick, um, a really quick run on how the realism debate goes. Um, for realism, that is the view that science tells us what's really going on out there. Um, one standard argument is the so-called no miracle success argument, and that's the argument we've been looking at to a certain extent, which simply projects from the success of the scientific enterprise and says, well, look, it would be a miracle if uh, science were as successful as it is unless it had latched on to the truth of things. Okay? So that's the basic form of the argument, and it has sophisticated versions. Um, science gives us the best explanation, um, and so on. I'm going to skip all that. Um, the other uh, interesting argument for a realist perspective is an argument that, curiously, philosophers, um, uh, at least 
in the 20th and early 21st century have stayed away from by and large. Um, it's a kind of Kantian argument, namely that how on earth could you understand what's going on in science unless you thought that science was exploring the world around us and, and giving us reliable and good information about it, right? So it's a necessary condition for understanding scientific practice. It's an argument philosophers have not paid nearly enough attention to. On the anti-realist side, we have the pessimistic meta-induction. Theories come and go, and with it, the ontologies of those theories. Um, and we have a, a, a very well-known standard argument, um, well-known to every scientist, certainly, um, the argument from underdetermination, which is simply to say that I don't care how much data you collect, I don't care what the quality is of it, and so forth, um, it always underdetermines the hypothesis. There are always many ways of accounting for the data. Well, there are many ways for accounting for the data. Why well, believe this one as opposed to that one? So that's again, pulls on the anti-realist side. Now, I'm not saying either for the realist or the anti-realist that any of these arguments are compelling or convincing. All of these arguments needed to, need to be looked at carefully and hedged about carefully. But these are the central kinds of arguments that one finds. Um, there is a third kind of anti-realist argument that's associated with constructivism. Uh, sometimes social constructivism would be a better phrase. Um, the constructivist project is uh, very straightforward. The constructivist project is to explain what scientists do, that is to explain scientific practice, without presupposing the truth of the theories that scientists employ. Okay? Now, if the constructivist project could be successful, then it would undercut the Kantian argument that um, we have to assume the reality of the world in order to understand science, but con constructivist project is precisely to understand science in all of its detail without presupposing the truth of the scientific theories that we're interested in. Okay, so that's the playing field for the debate. The problem is to, um, as it's come to be formulated, is to latch on to the no miracle success line, right? That pulls you towards a realist idea. If science is successful, would be a miracle if it didn't really get at a good part of the truth and in a way that avoids the pessimistic meta-induction. And there is a really generic form of a solution here, um, namely, find an X such that in successive scientific theories, X is preserved, okay? So it avoids the pessimistic meta-induction and that X is a ground for our scientific success, right? So there's the problem and there's the generic form of solution, okay? So, um, in Poincaré's hands, and in the hands of Weil, and in the hands of Russell, um, the X that we're looking for to provide the solution here is structure. So I want to devote the next five minutes um, to asking, what's special about structure? Why have we focused on structure? Is there anything special about structure? I want to offer you um, a set of incomplete arguments. I was about to say poor arguments. I hope they're not really very poor, but they are certainly incomplete. And um, what I'm not trying to do is to provide a knockdown argument that one should not be interested in structure or that structure is irrelevant, but I'm trying to disabuse you of the notion that structure is itself very interesting, okay? So that's the function of the next five minutes. Um, so suppose we're looking at theories which come and go, but in which structure is preserved, okay? Um, then what? Does it follow that the, that structure holds, really, truly? Okay, so I wanna give you some examples. So the question is, um, does the preservation of structure lead us to reality? So here's, uh, here's my first example. Um, it's very simple. Pretty amusing. Um, look at classical mechanics and look at a corollary to the second law. Okay, um, F equals ma. Um, so for a fixed mass, uh, force is a function of acceleration. Um, and for a fixed acceleration, uh, force is a function of mass. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Now, instead of looking at classical mechanics, look at classical economics and the law of supply and demand. Okay, well, that tells us that for a fixed, for a fixed supply, uh, the price is going to be a function of demand. And it also tells us that for a fixed demand, 
the price is um, going to be a function of supply. Okay, well that's pretty trivial. Um, thus, classical mechanics and classical economics share a rather interesting structure. Namely, there are three variables such that one of them is a function of each of the others, provided the third variable is held fixed. All right. So we have, as between classical mechanics and classical economics, um, a common structure. All right. And if you thought that there was an inference from common structure, structure preserved, to structure is real, then you really need to be asking yourself at this point, but in what domain is the structure real? What are we talking about that's, that's reality here? Okay. Well, obviously, this is a kind of category mistake that I've concocted all on my own. I can't blame anybody. I'm looking from economics on the one hand to mechanics on the other hand. So maybe the solution is to fix the domain. Right? And then look at what happens if structure is preserved in, as it were, roughly speaking, the, the same domain that we're working in. So we're not working here in economics and here in mechanics. Um, so do we now want to approve of the inference that the preservation of structure tells us that we've discovered something true um, about the domain? Well, so um, look at um, Newton's first law again uh, for big bodies in slow, in slow motion. Well, this is preserved, uh, at least approximately, uh, between Newtonian mechanics and special relativity. Um, so according to the inference, since it's preserved between the, that great scientific revolution, um, uh, the inference is real um, in this domain. Um, but of course, here's another structure that's preserved, uh, the global space-time structure in classical mechanics, and the global space-time structure in special relativity is flat. We work in flat Minkowski space. And so there's a structure that's preserved between um, the same two theories. Um, but of course, the global structure in general relativity is not flat, okay? Which suggests that we are a little hasty in saying, well, this is preserved uh, across the revolution, so therefore this is the mark of something real. Okay. Well, um, in addition to fixing the domain, since that, that doesn't work, um, what we could do is to add that the structure should be preserved not just across a couple of theories, classical mechanics to relativistic mechanics to general relativity, should be preserved across a whole bunch of theories. So maybe if something is just there across a whole bunch of theories, um, then that will show that it's a mark of what's real. Okay. Um, here, um, I want to um, give up the game of example and counterexample, um, although I can't quite tease myself away from it. So I'd suggest you make up your own examples. I think um, probably everyone in this audience knows um, quite a few examples that would work. Um, here's one of my favorites. Um, look at the structure um, that binds together state variables that we refer to as determinism. Okay. There's a long history of deterministic theories um, across many different domains in the sciences. And there's a long history of the termination of those deterministic theories and the intrusion of indeterministic theories. So this is a very nice example in which you have structure preserved across a whole bunch of things. Um, but it doesn't follow that the structure is, as it were, a mark of the real. OK. Um, so. Those considerations ought to lead us to think that there isn't a good inference of the form structure preserved implies blah, blah is real. Right? There is no simple in inference of that kind, I don't think. Um, what I want to show you now is that actually this whole business of preserving structures um, is in a certain sense trivial. That um, give me any bunch of scientific theories, say roughly in the same domain, there's always going to be structure preserved. And if there's always going to be structure preserved, then it can't be of any particular epistemological significance that there's structure preserved. Because the reason there's always structure preserved is purely logical. So I begin with a conjecture, which is that uh, where several theories succeed one another, um, there'll be, um, th there'll, let me read it. 
uh, succeed one another, there'll be areas where the theories do not disagree up to a certain order of approximation. So the theories might be radically different, but there'll be areas, some areas of application in which they basically agree, okay? That is, in fact, the way science works, right? We talk about scientific revolutions, but things change, but not everything changes. And between one theory and another, there's always overlap. Between that theory and a the third, there'll be overlap with the first and so on. So I take, I take that as a reasonable hypothesis about the history of science. So based on the conjecture, we can formulate the following theorem. Um, given any succession of theories, whether they're true theories or false theories, I don't care, um, there will be a relational structure that they all share, at least approximately, over some range of applications. Okay? So structure is trivial in the sense that it's always going to be shared. Um, what's the proof? Well, the proof is really pretty straightforward. The conjecture says that if we have a bunch of theories, successive theories, um, there'll be some domains of application um, in which they're consistent with one another. Okay, if there's a domain in which they're consistent, then we can formulate a first order theory of that domain. That first order theory will be consistent by assumption. Uh, therefore, by the completeness theorem, it will have a model. That model is, of course, nothing other than a relational structure. That's what we mean by a model. So, um, so the pr preservation of structure is pretty trivial. Okay, so, so far, um, um, we've got this far. Um, structure preservation across theories is a mark of the real. I want to say that doesn't work. Um, but we haven't got that structural preservation that underwrites success is a mark of the real. So um, I've been doing a little conjurer's trick here, um, um, directing you to one aspect of what the solution was supposed to be with my right hand while deflecting what my left hand is doing. So I've been looking at the significance of structure and whether structure or preservation of structure alone is a mark of the real uh, without saying, well, we're not just preserving structure, we want to preserve structure that grounds the success of the theories that we're talking about, okay? So we have to come back to this. Um, so the question is structural preservation that underwrites success. Is that going to be a mark of the real? Um, again, I would invite you to construct your own counterexamples. Again, um, I'll prime the pump by giving you one that you've already seen. Um, classical mechanics to special relativity with respect to global space-time structure, right? Um, that's, a, that's very nice, and that space-time structure grounds the success, if we use flat Minkowski space, grounds the success of special relativity. Um, but of course, that isn't going to be a mark of the real because it won't generalize up to general relativity. Um, okay, so um, this is an area where if I had half an hour more, I would try to construct some more examples, but I think um, you could, should construct your own. Instead, um, I want to end with a kind of deconstruction of the project rather than arguments about the details of the project. Um, so here's what I think is the usual heuristic that goes on um, in science. Um, we have an old theory and we have a new theory and the new theory has some kind of successful prediction and the new and the old theories, as I said before, generally overlap. So from the new theory, um, if we're lucky, we get a novel successful prediction of some sort or some kind of success. We can solve some problem that we couldn't solve before. Okay. Um, we take the success of the new theory as an indication that the new stuff that we've introduced is good stuff to introduce into the theory. right? That's how science usually works. We make a scientific shift. That shift is successful in a predictive and empirical sense. And we say, well, that redounds to the credit of the shift that we've made, okay? The heuristic um, in the program of scientific realism is exactly backwards. We introduce a new theory, right? The theory is successful, um, but the success of the new theory doesn't accrue to some new features in here, the success of the new theory accrues to the old stuff that the new theory shares with the old theory. 
namely in Poincaré's idea or in Viles or in Russell's, um, to the relations that are shared between the old theory and the new theory. That tends to confirm that those relations really refer to reality. Okay? Um, what I want to suggest is that, this, is that this is really a reactionary heuristic. Um, and I know I only have two minutes, so I will do this quickly in two minutes. Um, I want to contrast um, classical uh, quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, orthodox quantum mechanics, um, with uh, de Broglie-Bohm program. De Broglie in 1927 introduces an unorthodox way of thinking about quantum mechanics. Bohm in the 1950s revives that. Um, um, and uh, I was going to say improves on it. I'm not sure he improves on it. He adds a theory of measurement to it. And it's a lively program. Well, I work in foundations. And um, as some of you know, if you've touched on foundations, it's a shambles, right? I mean, there are a dozen competing foundational interpretations, each one trying to beat up on the other. And one of them is the de Broglie-Bohm program. What's really nice and interesting about de Broglie-Bohm is just this without going into the details. In orthodox quantum mechanics, we don't have a space-time theory. In general, things don't happen in a particular place at a particular time. And in general, um, processes don't have trajectories. Okay? That's a radically different kind of theory. In the Bohm theory, everything that happens has, happens at a particular place at a particular time. And particles or whatever are moving around um, in determinate spatial temporal trajectories. So the Bohm theory shares with classical mechanics this enormously important feature, right? That it's a space time theory. It's a, it's, a, it's a theory with processes that actually go on with trajectories and so on. Well, if we adopted the heuristic that's built into this structural realist program, we would say that the Bohmian theory simply wins out because all of the new successes of quantum mechanics will redound to the Bohmian theory because it shares that structure okay, with classical mechanics. And my view is that that's insane. So I will end by saying that what's happened here is we're playing the same old game that we've done in the realism debate for about 25 years. Um, we have a circle of question-begging assumptions. Uh, one wants to infer from some feature of scientific practice, namely the preservation of structure, to the truth in the correspondent sense of some aspect of scientific theories here that structure is real. Uh, but the inference um, has as a premise um, that utility or success is a mark of truth. Um, that's a premise that's disputed by various um, anti-realisms, by instrumentalist um, pictures in particular, and so the inference itself is, of course, question begging. Um, so what to do in these circumstances? Um, shall we simply say to my realist friends that they're irrational? Um, shall I sim simply say, as I tried once and got beat over the head, um, that you know, your realism is just a leap of faith. It's kind of like a religious faith or a political ideology, something like that. That didn't work very well. Um, so what I like is to try and follow this line of thought, that the only true criterion is to see what's possible and proper to do. This is very pragmatic, doing. Uh, there are no rigid criteria ever. You have to consider the contingencies of the period in question and those of today. And then you have to see what works. That's all. And although this may sound very Deweyan and very pragmatic and perhaps very American, um, this is actually Pierre Boulez um, in his thoughts on conducting. So I leave you with Boulez's thoughts about how to deal with structural realism. Thank you very much. Uh, we, have, uh, we have time for a few questions. I see one in the back. Yes. Professor Heinzmann. Yes. Um, I agree with you. Uh, if one accepts your definition of structural realism, that what is, uh, and you defined it with the continuity problem. But uh, there are two sides, naturally. There are the, the side of continuity and progress, and the other side is of the ontological problem. And if you 
take the uh, realist, anti-realist discussion and st structuralism discussion with respect to the ontological problem, I think Poincaré is not uh, a stru uh, uh, structural realist. Why? Because as, uh, as Hilbert, uh, as, uh, yes, as Hilbert, he, he, uh, he doesn't agree that the elements, that the, uh, the first elements of geometry are propositions. Hilbert says they are propositional, propositional schemata, and Poincaré says they are, are <coughs> apparent hypotheses, not, not true, not false. Now, Hilbert, to uh, justify these uh, uh, axiom schemata, he needs uh, uh, non-contradiction proof. Poincaré says, no, no, that is not a right way because of the impredicativity problem. He says, we should give a, a system that exemplifies the structure. And then he, in the foundations of geometry, he gives his uh, reconstruction, his uh, psycho uh, uh, psychological reconstruction of geometry. And this gives uh, this shows that he is not anti rem, uh, that the structure is not anti rem reality, but it, it is an, uh, uh, not uh, in re structure. It is uh, not two, but it is between, because it's, it's uh, uh, self reflection about the, the structure can itself be exemplified itself. So uh, it's a little bit in this, in this sense. Well, from this point of view, I would say Poincaré is not a, 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 a defender of a realism, of structural realism. But in your sense of continuity, you are right. Um, so, um, Professor Heitzman, I think, um, um, points us in the direction I mentioned um, very early on of there being a great tangle in the way uh, Poincaré sorts out the different kinds of hypotheses, or in this case, propositions. Um, and I actually um, am in very considerable agreement um, with your own way of trying to work through and sort it out. Um, but I think we all, all of us who read Poincaré have got to admit um, that it's a tangled, that his texts here are tangled. And it takes, it takes careful interpretive work to try to disentangle him. And here, the underdetermination problem um, rears its head in scholarship, just as it does in science. Namely, there's not just one way of trying to untangle them, although your way, I think, is, is, a, is a very, very excellent one. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I thought it would be um, a good idea to take a suggestion from Poincaré himself and to treat Poincaré's structural realism um, as a useful fiction. Okay? My aim, of course, is not to um, uh, construct an argument against Poincaré as a structural realist. My aim is really to construct an argument against the structural realist program per se, whether one attaches Poincaré in the ontological sense or not. So I, th I think that's a long way of saying we're in considerable agreement. Concernant euh, la philosophie de Poincaré, je pense que le mot philosophie est inadéquat. Il connaît le langage conscient, mais il s'en moque. Euh, ce serait mieux de parler de la pensée scientifique. Non, sorry. Euh, con concernant... <laughs> I need a translator. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> euh, concernant le réalisme scientifique, euh, non, le, euh, le réalisme structural, je pense que pour Poincaré, réalisme est complètement inadéquat et structural est un peu, un peu trop fort. Euh, C'est très difficile de saisir Poincaré. Euh, il est sur un équilibre instable que lui seul peut occuper. On tombe à gauche dans le conventionnalisme ou à droite dans le réalisme. Alors, je pense que le mieux pour lui, ça serait de parler de stabilité structurale, mais stabilité relationnelle serait peut-être mieux mais ce n'est pas, pas de l'invariance ni de la rigidité. Hein. Euh, 
D'accord, j'ai du mal parce que je ne trouve pas une question là-dedans. Non, non, mais c'est formuler une... euh, votre question. <rire> c'est une remarque ouais, euh, ouais, sur le... Ouais, ouais, ouais. C'est une remarque, d'accord. Donc, la remarque est que, si j'ai compris la partie centrale, par exemple, comme le Heitzman, mon contrôle de Poincaré comme structure réaliste est trop fort. Oui Le réalisme, oui, le structuralisme, non. Right, right. So, so, so Poincaré. So the picture is Poincaré is focused on structure, but he's not focused on structure as a realist, right? And I, I, um, again, this is this is a this is a very sensitive question, and we would have to look at a number of different texts. Some texts, I think, would go exactly um, in your way, and some texts would go differently. And that's why, in my talk, I tried to differentiate the problem of realism from the problem of objectivity. And he's a structuralist, without doubt, with respect to objectivity. Whether he's a structural realist, I think, is a, is a much more debatable question. Although he talks that way quite a lot. Poincaré try to define relation, or have you tried to define structure? <laughs> um, um, I, I, I think that this is a very, very good question, and, um, and I wish I had a proper answer for it. Um, what I'm taking as, uh, as relations are, first of all, uh, mathematical equations. So it's quite clear, I mean, for example, when he talks about Maxwell's equations and so on. That when, when you have uh, when you have a well-defined mathematical equation, that establishes a relational structure. Um, whether he would go beyond that to um, say, as I do in the middle of my talk, that you can use the completeness theorem to go from a consistent set of formulas to a model, and the model itself is a relational structure, whether he would recognize that in general, um, I think is something that we would have to look at really carefully. I suspect the answer is no, but but. Um, But it's, but it's a very good question. If we have uh, no more questions, let's thank uh, Professor Pliny. <laughs>